So if you've got a Bible with you this morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms. All right, if you don't know where Psalms is at, it's right in the middle. So it's pretty easy to find. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, the ushers are coming around. They want to get you a Bible. Wave to them. They will get you one so you can follow along with us this morning. Uh, It's right in the middle, and we're actually going to be in uh, Psalms 37. And really this morning, we're only really looking at one verse. Uh, So not not a lot that we're going to be digging our way through, but it's it's such a, an amazing thing that I think God is going to, to show us this morning. So, um, you know, we, we live, and you know this, we live in a, a massively divided time. Our world is divided. Our culture is divided. Our nation is divided. I mean, we are, we are split, not geographically, but the political division, uh, be- belief divisions. I mean, there is such a fracturing that is, it's a global thing, but it's something that we all experience. But as much division and as much as we do so many, we, we just tend to disagree over so much, as much as we tend to disagree, um, there are certain things that we all agree on. For example... I think everybody would agree that this is the best shirt that you've ever seen. Like that's, that's like there might be, <laughs> there's probably a few people on the fringes, but those are the crazy people, but most of us would agree, right? Seriously though, there are certain things that we would all agree on. For example, something that I think everyone globally would agree on is that our world is broken. I, I don't know of anybody who looks around our world and goes, yeah, look at this is exactly the way it should be. Our world is broken, and yet here's the question. So we can all agree on that, but here's the question that I want us to think about this morning. Why is it broken? If you could identify a root cause to the brokenness that people experience, not just out there, but in their own lives, what would it be? I think that would be an interesting question to go around and just ask the average person on the street. Just to say, hey, so I think we would all agree that the world is broken, but why do you think that is? What's the root cause? And that's actually a pretty important question because how we answer that question says what we think the solution ultimately is. Why is the world broken? In the church, I I think we tend to answer that question pretty quickly. And, And maybe we answer it quickly without really thinking about it as deeply as we should. I think in the church, when we ask the question, why is the world broken, we're, we're so quick to go to, well, sin. Sin's the reason our world is broken. All right, Adam and Eve back in the garden, God gave them everything. He said, don't eat from this tree. And what did they do? They disobeyed God. They ate from the tree. Sin entered the world. And that's why we've got brokenness and disease and broken relationships and broken homes and war and genocide and racism and hatred and all the division in our world is sin. And I wouldn't disagree with you. So just so you know, I don't disagree with that answer. But what I want to challenge you with, I want to challenge you to think more deeply about it this morning. And maybe in a way that you've never thought about it before. This morning is Vision Sunday, as Rob said, where we are, uh, we're looking out to a brand new ministry year. Ministry kicks off for us this morning as we launch into, we got Awana kicking off, youth ministry is kicking off, uh, Women's ministry has things going on. Uh, men's ministry, of course, is just continuing their, their, their pattern. There's just so much that's happening throughout our church right now as ministries get underway. And part of what we do as a church each year is give ourselves a, a, focal po- a focus point, if you will, a place that we challenge ourselves as a community together to grow. And we've been doing this really for the last four years. If you remember year one, and some of you won't remember because you weren't here, but I'll kind of catch you up. Year one, four years ago, was our stabilized year. Our church had been through a bunch of mess, lots of upheaval. It, it really was, there was a lot of brokenness. And so we needed to stabilize where we were at and to kind of right the ship in the waters. Year two was our solidify year, which was about taking the things that we were practicing, things that we'd set in place and practicing them and making sure that we were functioning. Now, now hear this. Uh, stabilizing and solidifying is something that always needs to be happening. It's not like, oh, we stabilize. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Like, there are ongoing things we have to stabilize. There's ongoing things we have to solidify. But we did those years. And then uh, we had an eight-month period, if you remember, that we called a warm-up. We were preparing for what we did last year. And last year was our stretch year. And what we were saying was, listen, 
yeah, we're not perfect. We haven't arrived as a church, but we've definitely experienced God healing and growing us. And so now the challenge is stretching. It's about stepping forward in faithfulness with what God's given us. We are stewards of God's resources. Everything that we have doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And if it belongs to God, then our responsibility is to use those things according to his plan. And so this whole last year was about saying, okay, what is what has God given us? And how are we going to step forward in faithfulness? Because God is never calling us to stagnate. He's never calling us to get stuck. He's always calling us upward. He's always calling us forward. And so how are we going to step forward together as a church? How are we going to stretch? So that's been the pattern over these last number of years. And this morning as we launch into this new year, we've got a new theme. And the theme is, you can go ahead and put up that first slide of the message. Our new theme is delight. We've been working hard over the last four years. And as we come to this year, I, I'm so excited about this theme because, listen, you might look at this and go, well, I mean, that sounds nice. Like, the whole practice of this year is what we're challenging ourselves is to learn how to enjoy God and how to enjoy each other. That's what we're challenging ourselves to as a church. And you might say, well, that doesn't really sound all that significant. Couldn't we have picked something far more important? And what I want to challenge you with this morning is we ask the question, why is our world broken? I want to challenge you with this, that this is actually the root issue. The reason that our world is broken, the reason that our lives are broken is because we have a broken delight. And remember, the answer to the question that we, that answer tells us what we need to do. If we're going to fix the brokenness, what do we have to do? If we're going to fix the brokenness, we have to fix the delight. Well, God's word shows us, and I'm going to show it to you because you might go, well, this, I, I, what, what in the world are you talking about? I'm going to show it to you. But hear this. If your delight is broken, your life is broken. But when we get delight right, what God's word tells us, when we get delight right, then your life becomes the life that it was created to be. And when we get delight right as a church and as a community together, we become the church that God created us to be. Again, it may sound crazy. It may not make any sense to you yet, but it's going to make sense by the end of this morning. And we're going to take a look at it here in Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. It's the only verse we're looking at this morning. Would you stand with me? And let's pray, and then we're going to read this verse together, all right? Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that we get to come here to celebrate, to worship, to launch into another ministry year. And, and God, we're, maybe some of us here at the start are already confused and going, what, what, is this, what is this that we're talking about? Why is delight so important? How in the world could this be a foundational issue to the brokenness that goes on around our world? Lord, I pray if it's true that you would show us how it is true. I pray that you would teach us from your word, that you would show us your ways. And God, that this year would indeed be a year where we grow in delight, that we would grow in learning how to enjoy you and how to enjoy each other, and that we would do it, God, because it's what you want us to do. It's a wonderful thing. It's an exciting opportunity. And God, my prayer as we launch into this year is that we wouldn't squander, we wouldn't waste the opportunity that even today would be that moment where we come face to face with the truth of your, not just call, but your command to delight. Teach us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Psalm 37, verse 4, take a look. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is God's word. You can go ahead and be seated. So five things that I want to walk uh, through with you this morning in terms of delight. And here's just number one. Number one is this. You were designed for delight. You were made for it. And here's where I see it. Again, look at Psalm 37. Just look at the very first word, verse 4. What does it say? What's it say? Say it again. What does it say? delight. Now, I want you to understand when it says delight here in this moment, it's not saying it as just an encouragement. It's not saying it as a suggestion. In this moment, God's word is giving us a command. And the command is to delight. Now, the word delight, I think this is pretty amazing. The word delight in this verse means to enjoy or to take pleasure in. Later on, if you actually look down in verse uh, 23, it says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. There's another Hebrew word there for the word delight, and it literally means, it can literally mean to have fun. 
And so here we come to a place in God's word where we are being given a command by God, and the command is enjoy. The command is take pleasure in. The command is even have fun. And by the way, it's not the only place that we're given this command. It's actually throughout scripture. I'll give you one other one. It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says this, rejoice, which by the way, the word rejoice is another word for delight, just in case we're, you don't know that. Rejoice means delight. He says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, here's why I think this is amazing. I think it's amazing because so often we tend to see God as the ultimate killjoy. Our world treats God as the one who doesn't give joy but steals it. We tend to look at all of God's commands as things that are keeping us from real enjoyment of life. If I want to enjoy life, then I go. I mean, people will say, hey, listen, I'm just going to enjoy life and I'll follow God later. As if following God is the absence of enjoyment and the absence of God is the presence of enjoyment. And yet here in this moment, God is making it very clear that his goal is not to steal your joy His goal is to bring joy. His goal is not to take delight, but his goal is to give delight. In fact, it's not just a goal. It's a command in your life. It's a command in my life. He's saying, I want you to practice delight in your life. I want you to learn how how to actually enjoy. And the reason that he gives us this as a command, I mean, you think about this. When God gives commands... The reason he gives commands is because it's revealing your design. God doesn't give you commands to call you to do something that you weren't made for. God always gives commands to call you to something that you were made for. So when God says, command, delight, and by the way, Paul, some of us were raised in traditions that tell us that God isn't about enjoyment. God is actually against the idea of pleasure. And fun is something that happens outside of church. And for those people, when Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, and he goes, here, let me say it again. For all the people in the room that are going, uh, you know, hold on, I'm not really sure that that's something that's biblical. Are we supposed to be really doing that? He says, let me just say it again in case anybody's confused. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice, delight. This is what God wants you to do. It's what you were made for. It's what you were designed for. God's commands reveal your design. So when God commands delight, he's saying, this is what you were made to do. I made you to delight. And look, let me just illustrate it. When you walked in the room this morning, there was a present on your seat. And what I want you to do right now, I want you to pick it up. I know I'm going to ask you to do something very specifically. We're all going to do it together. I want you to open the present right now. Go ahead, open it up. Now look, here's the deal. Some of you, uh, if you don't, does anybody not have something on their seat? Like a whole bunch of you maybe don't. Everybody should have something. If you don't have something, raise your hand. Everybody's good to go. Oh, yeah, you guys back there. We don't give you guys stuff. Just kidding. If what you get, you can't eat, we actually have uh, bags of Skittles in the back. For those of you who can't eat chocolate or something else, we do have bags of Skittles in the back. Is there somebody who needs a bag of Skittles in replace? And you can trade with the people around you. All right, so everybody get, anybody needs Skittles instead? All right, you're good to go. Okay, so here's, get your, get your candy. And I want you to do something with me for a moment. Okay, I want you to open it, and we're going to hold, don't take a bite yet. We're going to take a bite together, and, but I, I want you, don't, not yet, I want to just kind of give you some instruction. You're going to take a bite, and you're going to savor it. So you're not a vacuum, you're not like my kids, I, one of my sons, no joke, when uh, he would eat hot dogs, I won't tell you who it was, but when he would eat hot dogs, he, the hot dog would be in the bun, and he would hold it like this. And as he would eat it, he wouldn't eat the bun, he would just eat the hot dog, and literally the bun would split over his face, and it was like, and he was done. It was amazing. I thought about entering him in hot dog eating contest, but I think you have to eat the bun too, but he was just like, so we're not going to eat it like that. I want you to just, we're just going to take one bite, and I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to savor it, okay? So ready? Take a bite. Close your eyes. Don't talk with your mouth full. And I want you to think about something as you're chewing on that bite and as you're savoring it, I want want you to think about this question. 
Why did God make you with taste buds? And having made you with taste buds, why did he make you make things that tasted so good? There are some things that you eat and they taste terrible, and there are some things that you taste and you, you delight. It's an enjoyment. It's a pleasurable experience. Why did God create you with taste buds? And then why in the world would he make things? Why not just make everything bland? Why didn't he make everything tasteless? Open your eyes. And now let me ask you this question. Why did God create you with the, sense, the ability to see? And not just with the ability to see. Anybody could go, well, I mean, he made us with the ability to see so we wouldn't bang into stuff and we could know where we're going. Okay, so, but why did he make you with the ability to see colors? Right? You can look and you can see Tom Ivanek's shirt back there with the bright yellow and the, right? Why did he make you with the ability to see colors and then such a beautiful shirt like that? Why did God create all the colors? Why does he paint a beautiful sky at a sunset or a sunrise that you can look and you can see all of these colors? Why did he create you with a sense of touch so that on a hot and humid day when there's a cool breeze that you feel it go across your skin and it's enjoyable or on a cold night that you sit at a fire and you feel the warmth that's radiating onto your skin and it feels so good or the touch of a hand from someone who loves you? Why did God create you with all of these? And we could go through every single one of them. And the answer is that God created you with those things because he designed you from the very beginning with the ability to delight. He made you to delight, but not only did he make you to delight, get this, he saved you to delight. God sent his son Jesus into this world to live the life you couldn't, to die the death that you deserved, to be buried, to rise again, to conquer sin and death so that you might be rescued back into a right relationship with him and in that relationship to experience the fullness of joy. Psalm chapter 16, and again, joy and delight are intertwined. You cannot have delight without joy and you can't have joy without delight. Psalm chapter 16 verse 11 says that at his right hand are joys unspeakable, in his presence are pleasures forevermore. Do you know what that means? That means that one day when we get to heaven, we are going to experience joys unspeakable and pleasures forevermore. That's what's coming. But it's not just what's coming. Get this. When Jesus came, John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says this, these things I've spoken to you that my joy, my delight may be in you and that your joy may be full. In other words, it's not just something that we're meant to wait for. Jesus came so that we might experience it today. And not just a little bit of it. Jesus says his goal is that we would experience the fullness of it. God wants you to experience soul-satisfying, life-altering, lasting, eternal, true delight. That's your design. But here's point number two. The context of the experience of that joy, the context of your delight is in a relationship with God. Look at what he says. He says this, delight yourself where? What's the next statement? In the Lord. The context of your delight is to be in the Lord, not in stuff, not in the things. The primary context of your delight is in a relationship with God. And there's plenty of other places that the Bible talks about this. Let me just read a couple of them to you. Psalm chapter 32, 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Be glad in the Lord. Again, it's that idea of rejoicing and delighting. Romans chapter 5, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And listen, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We rejoice. We delight in God. The only way, by the way, you can delight in God is through Jesus Christ. But again, the context of that delight is in God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble, and it's safe for you. In other words, Paul says, I keep telling you the same thing over and over, and actually that's a good thing for you. Because you need to be reminded of it. You're meant to delight in the Lord. Let me say it again. You're meant to delight in the Lord. You're meant to delight in the Lord. In fact, one chapter later, he says it. Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord, and I will say it again, rejoice. The context of our rejoicing is meant to be in the Lord. In other words, if delight means that we are to enjoy, take pleasure in, and have, even have fun, then the context of our enjoyment and the context of our pleasure and the context even of having fun is meant to be in our relationship with God. 
Now, for some of us, that's groundbreaking. Because for some of us, we've been raised in traditions where God is boring, God is dry, God is everything but fun. God is everything but pleasurable. God is everything but enjoyment. We've grown up in traditions that have taught us that God is a harsh taskmaster. And what all these verses are telling us is that the place that we're supposed to find the supreme enjoyment and the supreme pleasure in life is in the context of a relationship with God. The Westminster Catechism, and by the way, a catechism is just a discipleship tool. Some of you have been through it. Some of you have no idea what it is. Westminster Catechism, a catechism is just simply a, it is a discipleship tool. It asks a series of questions and provides answers with scripture that's meant to kind of teach people truth. The very first question of the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Which in today's language means, why are we here? (laughs) What's our purpose? And the answer is this. That we are to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And our tendency is to focus on this idea of glorifying God, which most people have no idea what that even means. Quite frankly, I, I grew up in the church, and I, I, we, we use the, the language, we're to bring glory to God. But what does that even mean? Have you really stopped to think about what, is, what does it mean to bring glory to God? I mean, God already has glory. Like, I can't give God more glory than He already has, so what does that mean? To give glory to God. What it means to give glory to God is to, it's to recognize his, the word glory means weight. It means the weight of the significance of something. To glorify God is to recognize God as the one who has the ultimate weight. He is the most significant one. It is to, to bring glory to God is to make much of him. In fact, what that answer, the answer to the question in the catechism, it says to glorify, to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. Those two things are actually connected together. It's not giving us two separate things as if, well, you glorify God and then over here you enjoy him together. It's saying we glorify God and how do we do that? When we enjoy him forever. Because when you enjoy him forever, what do you do? When you enjoy something, when you delight in something, you recognize its value you honor its value, you treat it as, not only do you recognize that it's valuable, you treat it as valuable, you praise its value, and you tell everybody else about how valuable it is. I mean, that's what you do. I mean, look, I delight in my wife. I think she's pretty amazing. And so what does that mean? I recognize how valuable she is. I honor how valuable she is, at least as best as I can as a fallen man. I try to honor how valuable she is. And then not only that, I tell her how valuable she is. And then I get up here and guess what I do? I tell you how valuable she is. Why? Because I'm delighting in her. See, when you delight in God, that's what it looks like. And that's the context You were made for delight, and the context that you were to delight, the context you were to experience that soul-satisfying, life-altering, lasting joy is enjoying God forever. And see, that's why I say the answer to the question, why is our world broken, is delight. The issue isn't that we don't delight. The issue is that we delight in the wrong things. Here's Here's point number three. The reason we're broken is because our delight is broken. Blaise Pascal, who was a, uh, a, he was a physicist and philosopher, theologian back in the 1600s, once put it this way. He says, all men seek happiness. All men seek happiness, which by the way, at that time meant joy and delight. Happiness, when we sing, when, you know, because I'm happy, clap along if you feel like, a, you know. That song, we mean something different now by happy than they did then. Happiness meant joy, and therefore it meant delight. Real delight. All men seek delight. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, we all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. I want you to hear what he's saying. And he's absolute, I believe he's absolutely right. And I'm going to show you why I say that. I think we've already proved it, but but I'm going to show it to you even more. He's saying the reason that everybody does what they do is because of delight. The reason some people got up this morning and came into church is because of delight. For whatever reason, we believe that the best thing to do was to show up here, to be here in this room, that we, whether it was because we wanted to show up and just see friends, or whether we showed up because our family was going to be here and we felt like we needed to be here because our family was going to be here, whatever it was, we felt that the best decision 
was to show up and be here. The reason that other people slept in and they didn't come here is because of delight as well. They believed that the more delightful thing to do was to sleep in, stay in bed, and, and wake up later. Pascal says the reason that everybody does what they do is because of delight. That's the reason that at the end of the day, we make every decision that we make. Which means if our delight is broken, our life is broken. If you get delight right, then, then what does that do? It leads you into the right path. So let me show you. You say, well, I'm not really sure about that. Well, let me take you back. Keep your finger there in, Gen in, in Psalm chapter 37. And I want you to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible with me, back to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 6. So you say, I'm not convinced. Okay, that's good. That's good. Let's, let's look together. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, to catch anybody up who doesn't know, Genesis chapter 3 is the place where sin enters the world. God has made Adam and Eve. He's placed them in a perfect world. He said, I don't want you to eat from this tree. Everything's been going well. They've got no sin. They've got a perfect relationship with God. The world is as it should be. But then Satan comes along and he tempts them. And Satan comes to Eve. And by the way, Adam's there. He's just silent. And he says, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And of course, the answer is no. God just said we couldn't eat from this tree. But then he says, not only could we not eat from the tree, but we can't touch it. Now, God didn't say that. God just said, don't eat from the tree. But Satan comes back and he says, no, no, no. You see, God's lying to you. If you eat from the tree, you're not going to die. What's going to happen is you're going to become God. And look what happens in chapter 3. Look at verse 6. What does it say happens? So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and listen, and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. It was a delight and a desire. And hear this this morning, delight and desire, are di they're directly connected. What you desire, what you delight in is what you desire. So you need to understand that when she delights in the fruit, when she looks at that tree, she's not just delighting in what it looks like. She's in delighting in what she sees it as offering to her in this moment. In other words, the shift that takes place that leads to the sin is that Eve goes from delighting in God to delighting in what? In her taking God's place, in her rising to the place of God, in her knowing both good and evil, in her having insight that God has that belongs only to God. What was the issue? What happened in that moment? It was an issue of delight, and I want you to hear this. Ever since then, the root cause of sin in every single one of our lives is that we've been delighting in things other than God. We've been pursuing a delight that's meant to be found in a relationship with God in the things of this world. C.S. Lewis, in, in his uh, message, The Weight of Glory, puts it this way. He says, there was once in man a true delight. A true happiness is the word he uses, but again, it means delight. A true delight of which there now remain to him only the mark and empty trace, which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings, Seeking from things absent the help he does not obtain in things present. But these are all inadequate because the infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, only by God himself. He says, since that moment, we have been trying to fill this vacuum that was created, a vacuum of delight. See, our delight can only be satisfied in God. It can only be truly, that, that soul-satisfying delight can only be found in relationship with God. But the moment we delighted in something other than God, the emptiness came in. And what we've been doing ever since is trying to fill that, that hole, the delight gap in our lives, with the stuff of this world. Which, by the way, is what Psalm 37 is really all about. Turn back to Psalm 37 with me. So we've only looked at one verse this morning, but I'm just going to give you the context because this is absolutely critical to understand why we're being given this command to delight. Look at what he says. Look at the very first verse, verse 1 of Psalm 37. I'm in chapter 40. 37. Here we go. Verse 1, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. So he's talking about this danger of envy. Now, why would we be envious of evildoers? Well, he explains later on in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the, ones who, the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. See, the reason, and if you want to get a bigger picture of this, you can read Psalm 73 on your own another time. But he says, here's the danger. The danger is here we are and we're serving God and we're following after him with our lives and we're trying to pursue him. And listen, let's just be honest, in a broken world, it's hard to do. It's not an easy thing. And what at times happens, and some of us have experienced this, maybe all of us, 
where we look around and we see people who aren't following God at all. They don't want anything to do with him. And they seem to be succeeding at everything. They seem to have everything. I mean, they, they just seem to have joy. They seem to be enjoying life. They seem to be having fun. They've got all the wealth. They've got the house. They've got the cars. They've got the stuff. And what happens is, is our delight begins to shift. Tell me this has never happened to you because it's happened to me. My delight starts to shift and I start looking at them and I start going, well, look at, they're, they're enjoying stuff. They, they've got all of these things. I mean, they're not even following God and look at the stuff that they have. If I had that stuff, then maybe my pleasure, my delight, the emptiness of the delight in my life would be satisfied if only I had that, if I had the better car, if I had the better house, if I had the better, the, the better job, if I had the better, the more money, the bigger bank account, or the, whatever it is, if I had that stuff that they have, then maybe I would be satisfied. Do you want to know what envy is? It's misdirected delight. And the reason David is writing this is he sees this in himself. He's not just writing to everybody else. He's saying, David, stop it. Because the truth is that he gets to is this. It's all a facade. It's all a facade. Jeremiah talks about it. God talks about it in Jeremiah as, as uh, broken cisterns. When we try to fill our lives up with the light, with the stuff of this world, it's like a broken cistern. It fills up, but you know what happens with a broken cistern, right? Cistern catches water. What happens? It ends up running out. It fills up and it runs out. It fills up and it runs out. And it fills up and runs out. And the people of this world who are out there who are pursuing a delight apart from a relationship with God, does it mean they don't have any delight at all? No, they definitely are experiencing some form of delight, but it's an empty delight. And here's the thing. It will not last. They are trading long-term delight in a relationship with God for short-term delight. And here's the deal. As much as you may delight in the things of this world, one day you will go to a place where you can take none of it with you. And the only thing that you will be left with is with your ultimate delight. And if it wasn't in God, you will have nothing. Why is our world broken? Is because we have a delight problem. Not that we don't delight, but we delight in the wrong things. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He continues in The Weight of Glory. He says this, If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. What's the problem with our delight? It's that we're willing to settle. We're willing to settle for so much less. Our world is broken because we're not delighting where our delight is meant to be found. It started with Adam and Eve and it's carried all the way down to you and to me. Which means if we're going to fix this, what does that mean? What do we have to do? Again, the answer shows us what the solution is. The solution is we've got to fix the problem of delight. But how do we do that? Well, he says it. What do we do? He says, here's, here's point number four. Here's what we have to do. Delight must become a discipline. Or I'll say it this way. I'll say it a different way. We have to discipline our delight. See, because we're already delighting. The problem isn't that we're not delighting. The problem is our delight is so easily swayed and pulled to the wrong things. And so if we're going to delight in the right things, you have to learn how to focus your, de your delight. And where is it meant to be focused? It's meant to be focused in the Lord. Now, now here's the deal. The question is, how do we delight in the Lord? Good news. We're going to spend this whole next year talking about it. Not on Sunday mornings per se, though we will have times where we do. But in my weekly emails, I'll be talking about it. We will be giving you specific opportunities each month to practice delighting. And we'll talk about that as we go. But this morning, let me just give you a few thoughts in terms of how do you practice delighting in the Lord. Let me just give you a few quick thoughts. Number one, you have to, and this is, this is actually not number one. This is the whole thing. If you're going to delight in the Lord, you have to delight in the relationship that he's given you through Jesus Christ. All right, I talked about using my... Our, my relationship with Sarah earlier as an illustration, right? If I delight in my wife, I have to delight in her relationally. She's not an object, she's a person. God is not an object, he's a person. If you're going to delight in the Lord, you can't treat him as an object, you have to treat him as a person. You have to, have, you have to engage in relationship with him. And what does that look like? Number one, get to know him. If you delight in someone, you don't ignore them. 
you actually engage and you, you want to get to know more and more about them. When Sarah and I first met, we used to go out for coffee. This is back when we were in college, right? We'd go out for coffee and we'd like spend hours just talking. Then we would go back to our dorm rooms and we would call each other and talk on the phone more. You remember that? Like you loved me so much. And then, <laughs> and then she got to know me after we got married and it's like, oh, but seriously, that's what you do when you delight. You get to know them. How do we get to know God? Where does he talk to us from? Right here. Right here in his word. This isn't just a, this is not a book written by men about God. This is God breathed. Men, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, wrote this down as God was directing them to show us not just tips on how to live. Do you understand that this book was given to you? Not so you just know how to live life, but so that you could know God. But so you could know the creator of the, your creator your savior. And I get it. Like sometimes we approach this book like a duty and a job and we go, man, it's so, you know, one of my sons, again, I won't tell you which one, but he goes to me, dad, it's just boring. I love it. I love that he's honest like that because lots of us, we feel the same way, but we don't say it because we're older and we're a little bit more refined. And so we know that's not really acceptable, right? So we don't, we're not as honest, but look, sometimes we approach this as it's boring. I want you to hear just one thing. This is from a book called Enjoy, and it's a worthwhile read. And the author says this, she says, we aren't necessarily going after spiritual highs every time we engage God's word. If you approach the word with a mindset that if you don't feel something, then you aren't getting anything from it, you won't read it. Here, listen, we find joy in scripture, not because it makes us feel good, but because it leads us to the one who spoke it into existence. The creator of the universe says he wants you to know him so much so that he gave you his word he preserved it for you so that you could have this book and many of us have multiple Bibles in our homes. You're going to delight in God. You've got to get into his word. Number two, pray. Not only does, think about this. This is absolutely mind-blowing. Not only does God want to talk to you, he wants you to talk to him. The creator of the universe so wanted you to talk to him that he made it possible by sending his son Jesus into this world for his body to be broken, his blood to be shed so that a way could be opened so that you wouldn't have to go through a priest to get to God, but that you could go at any moment straight into the very presence of God. You're going to delight in God. You've got to enjoy the relationship. How do you enjoy the relationship? You get to know him. You spend time talking to him. Number three, if you're going to enjoy the relationship, if you're going to delight in God, practice praise. Worship. I think sometimes we devalue worship. We don't place the value on worship that we should. Some of us go, why in the world do we sing songs? And I know singing is just a part of worship. But get this, it's going to be a part of worship for eternity. Revelations, there's like just outbreaks of singing songs. It's like a musical, right? Like everybody's talking, then suddenly somebody starts singing. I mean, heaven is a place where people just break out in singing. Why? Because you know what you do when you delight in something? You praise it. Don't you? You celebrate it. What is worship but the valuing of God? And when we devalue worship, we are actually devaluing God. We're saying, you're not worth it. I mean, we just sang songs, and you know what? Every single one of those songs we were singing is about the greatness and the glory and the wonder of God. We're not singing songs just for the sake of having songs to sing. We're talking to God. And it's something that we're going to be doing for all of eternity. You want to delight in God, practice worship. And again, it's got to be a discipline, right? You've got to focus it. It's not something you're just going to trip into. Two other thoughts. Last two thoughts on this. Share it. Share it. Talk about God with the people around you. Share the greatness and the goodness of your God. You know what the thing about good news is? You can't help but tell people. It's so hard to keep good news isn't in, isn't it? I mean, you just naturally want to tell people why. A part of it is because the sharing of good news heightens the delight of it. There's something about it that when I share good news with you and you go, man, that is good news, the enjoyment of it goes up. And see, when we share together the goodness of God and we talk about just how great he is, do you know what it does? It raises our delight. And then last thing. And again, we're going to talk about this all year long, so I'm just giving you a snapshot. There's so much more that we could say about this. Last thing, enjoy his gifts. Enjoy his gifts. You know, honestly, we're so afraid of enjoying the gifts of God. And when I'm talking about the gifts of God, we're not, I'm not talking at this moment about spiritual gifts, though certainly those are something we enjoyed. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good thing 
that comes into your life is a gift from God. And we're afraid of enjoying the gifts, and some of it is because we're afraid of this whole, like, uh, you know, doing what the world does. We're, we enjoy the gifts more than we enjoy the giver. But you have to understand, why did God give us good things? Why, did God, why does God pour all these good things in your life? And by the way, it's so important for us to say this. God is pouring good things into your life all the time. All the time. And most of the time, you don't recognize just how good it is because you forget how bad it should be. We look around and we go, when's the last time God did something good for us? And I've had people say this to me. When's the last time God did something good, good for me? He did a good thing for you that he, today. If you woke up and you're breathing and you have a home and you've got, you've got food to eat and you've got clothes to wear, all the good things that God has poured in your life. Why? Because here's the reality. Because of sin, we've deserved infinitely worse. We deserve a world that's absent of God. And yet every moment of our day is some presence of God's grace for both Christian and non-Christian alike poured out into our lives. The goodness of God is constantly being poured in. And why did he give us these good things? 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, Paul says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But listen, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Why did God give you all the good things that you have? To enjoy them not as an end in themselves, but as a means to pointing us back to the giver. See, to enjoy the gifts of God, do you know what it means? you know what it looks like to enjoy the gifts of God? First of all, when I enjoy the gifts of God, I use them according to his design. I don't misuse them. But number two, when I enjoy the gifts of God, do you know what I do? I say thank you. I say thank you. And it's not a silly thing that when I eat a good meal or I enjoy a beautiful day or a sunset to just say, thank you, God, because you gave that to me. Those are just some ideas, but boy, if we're going to learn, if we're going to fix the problem of the brokenness, we've got to learn how to delight and the delight in the right things. We have to discipline that delight. We have to focus it. And here's the last thing I'll say. Number five. The discipline of delight leads to greater delight. God says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, there's a lot of people who have misused that verse. You know what people will do with this verse? Is they'll go, oh, so if I delight in God, he'll give me the raise. If I delight in God, he'll give me the job or he'll give me the car or he'll give me the house or he'll give me whatever it is. He gives me the stuff as long as I delight in him. Do you know what the problem with, this, that, with that is? In that moment, what are you actually delighting in? See, when you say that, you've already missed the whole point. <laughs> because what you're saying is, I'm going to use God to get to what I really delight in. If I delight in God, I'll get to the money that I want. If I delight in God, I'll get to the house I want. If I delight in God, I'll get to the health I want. If I delight in God... See, your desire is connected to your delight. What you ultimately desire is what you ultimately delight in. And so in those moments, you're not really delighting in God. You're delighting in the stuff. When God says, delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of, his, of your heart, do you know what he's really saying? At least at the very biggest, the, the, the most important piece of it that he's saying is this. When you delight in God, what are you really desiring? Him. And what does he promise to give you? The greatest soul-satisfying, life-altering, lasting, true joy of all, himself. That's why heaven will be the place of unspeakable unshakable joy. But it isn't just something that God wants you to experience one day. It's something that Jesus says, I came so that you might experience it today. How do you do that? Look, let me just give you these, these just close it this way. Number one, you can't experience the joy God intends for you, the delight God wants for you if you don't do it through Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's where it starts today. At least that's the invitation. You can't get there any other way. There is a brokenness in your life that you cannot heal. Only God can heal the ultimate delight issue in your life. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins that were the result of your misdirected delight. Jesus suffered the full penalty that your, disins, your sins deserved on that cross. He died, was buried, rose again, conquered sin and death, not so that you could have a little bit of help to earn salvation, but so that you could receive it as the greatest gift of all. Because that salvation is a gift, not just of escaping hell, but of having a relationship, a right relationship with the God who made you. 
And the invitation is to stop working and to trust that Jesus did it all for you. That's number one. Number two, if you have believed that, then maybe the first place we need to start is with confessing our lack of delight. To own the fact that we have places, all of us have places in our lives. Nobody in this room is sinless. You know what that tells me? Everybody in the room has a delight problem. And so here's what you need to start with. Confess the fact that there is delight issues in your life, that there are things you're delighting in over God. Number two, pray that God would help you to actually learn how delighting in Him is far greater than whatever it is that you, that thing is that you're delighting in. And then number three, practice it. Practice, to del- practice that delight. And I gave you some ideas, but listen, every single month this year, and you'll find out next week, we're going to have for September, and then we're going to have something for August, and something, or something for August, something for August, but before that, we'll have something for October and November. Each month, we're going to give ourselves a challenge as a church to practice delight, and we're going to do it all year long. And my prayer for us is that we would all learn that true joy that God intends us for, that we would experience that soul-satisfying, life-altering delight that can only and truly be experienced in him. And we're going to celebrate the basis of it right now as we come to this table and we remember his body broken, his blood shed for us. This table, as we come to it in these next few moments, there's two requirements. The first is that you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, even if you're visiting this morning, your family. And so this is a table that's open to you because it's about believing and trusting in Jesus as our Savior. The second is that we examine our lives. And in the context, listen, here's where we're going. Where is the delight broken in your life? We come to this table and we come not as hopeless people, but we come as those with the greatest hope of all because Jesus has done it all for us. So we come confessing. And for those of us who confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so this is a celebration. This is a table of delight. 